Well, today we're going to talk about the age of discovery, 1400 to 1700. 1400 is generally accepted as the beginning of the age of discovery or the age of exploration. Uh, 1700, some people say it's 1700, some people say it's 1800. Uh, I've just chosen 1700 today. And as you can see, it was during that period of time that the nations of Europe sent out mariners across the world. Uh, most of the world was unknown to the nations, uh, the, the monarchs of Europe. And so it was during this period of time that Portugal, Spain, England and France and uh, the Netherlands and other countries as well sent out maritime explorers. These are the four questions that I am going to answer today. Uh, as I proceed to share all of this information with you. Did Com Columbus believe the world was flat? That's what I was taught in elementary school. Why do Brazilians speak Portuguese instead of Spanish? You may have wondered about that. Who was the first man to sail around the world? By the way, it wasn't Magellan. And who discovered the Pacific Ocean? The first one was not Balboa. So stay in your seats and I'll answer those questions for you. We're going to start off uh, in, uh, with the travels of Marco Polo. Marco Polo was a, a Venetian merchant who embarked on a 24-year journey with his father and his uncle to explore trade possibilities in Asia. Now, shortly before that period of time, the Mongol Empire had created a very stable environment for trade. Throughout that entire uh, distance from from Europe over to Asia, the Mongol Empire covered that entire uh, area of territory and consequently trade routes developed over a period of time. As you can see, some of them were on the land and some of them were on the sea. And in fact, that is the route that Marco Polo and his father and uncle followed during their 24 year journey. There were some very, very valuable trade goods in the Far East that the merchants, the wealthy people in Europe really, really wanted to have in abundance. Silk being one of them. All of the clothing in Europe at that time was wool or cotton or, or possibly leather. And silk was a miracle fiber, a miracle textile. As you can see, it absorbs a great deal of water without feeling wet. It's cool, repels mold and mildew, is lightweight and soft. So it was something that everyone wanted to have. Fine porcelain from the Far East was highly, highly valued. And why do we call it China? Because it originated in China. But of all of the trade goods, spices were the most coveted, the most valued. And the three most important spices were the ones that I've shown up here on the slide. Nutmeg, cloves, and pepper. They used those spices for a variety of reasons that I've listed there at the bottom. Particularly, they were very, very helpful in, in uh, preserving food and making it palatable. As you can imagine, with no refrigeration and not a lot of understanding of how to preserve food, a lot of the food turned and was rancid and using spices made that food more palatable and more easy to eat. The most valuable of these three spices was pepper, originating in India. And a pound of peppercorns were, if that, the price of a pound of peppercorns was sufficient to buy the freedom of a slave. It was that, that valued, something that we take so much for granted now, was so greatly cherished and valued in those days. Trade routes developed, and if you'll look carefully here, the, the orange route is the main Silk Road, the main uh, thoroughfare from the Far East to Europe. And of course, there were feeder roads off of that, feeder routes, and there, in, in addition, was a sea route, as you can see if you follow along from Canton around Malacca and so forth. And all of them converged in Constantinople. That's a very important thing to remember because in May 29th of 1453, 
the Moors were finally able, the Muslim Turks were finally able to overcome the defenses of Constantinople. Then, as now, there was a great deal of animosity between the Muslims and the Christians. And the Muslim Turks closed off all trade through Constantinople, thereby shutting off the supply of these very, very highly valued trade goods that we've been talking about. And it became necessary for the kingdoms of Europe to find another way to get to the source of those trade goods. And so they, when Constantinople was shut off, they began to explore different ways of getting to the Far East. And that's what we're, we're really going to be talking about today. <clears throat> now, one of the most difficult nuts to crack for these ancient mariners was the problem of scurvy. As you can see, the symptoms are just horrific. And if untreated, could lead to significant disability and death. In fact, it wasn't unusual for long uh, voyages. By, by uh, half of the way through the voyage, or uh, two-thirds of the way through the voyage, most of the crew was debilitated by scurvy. And for centuries, it wasn't until the middle of the 18th century that the British finally discovered the medicine that would help mariners avoid scurvy. After trying mustard and vinegar and all kinds of soup and various other commodities, they discovered that citrus fruit was a consumption of citrus fruit enabled the sailors to avoid scurvy. And that is why British sailors are called limeys because of the citrus fruit. Now, a moment ago I showed you the trade routes and the sea route went very, very close to land all the way from the, the far east, very close to land around India and so forth. And the reason for that was the seagoing vessels, the vessels at that point were really not seagoing vessels. They were so fragile and easily overcome by strong winds and ocean currents that the sailors never left sight of land if they could avoid doing so because they were so vulnerable in these small sailing ships. One of the major innovations that started to open up possibilities of seagoing travel was the invention of the caravel. This, by the way, is a picture of the replication of the Nina and the Penta. And both of them are caravels. They were developed about 1450 by Prince Henry of Portugal. And they were the first ships to leave coastal waters and to sail out into the open Atlantic. The Karak was an extension of the caravels, uh, somewhat larger, and it was the precursor to the galleon. Now, to give you an idea, I was talking with uh, David a, a moment ago. Uh, these Karaks were only about 55 to 60 feet long. And so we're not talking about much more than the width of the stage. That's how large those ships were. Not large at all, but still, they were seaworthy and large enough to go onto the ocean. And by the way, that is a representation of the Santa Maria, which was a Karak. They had available to them quite a few navigation aids. Ephraimides were star charts. They were able, they had mapped the stars. And so by using the quadrants and the astrolabes to measure the angle of these celestial bodies, they were able to determine their latitude. They were never, until the middle of the 18th century, they weren't able to determine their longitude. So during all of this period of time that we're talking about, they were not able to determine their east-west orientation, only their north-south orientation. And by the way, that kind of navigation is called dead reckoning. And as you can imagine, if you don't know where you are on an east-west orientation, you might well end up on the rocks. So it was still very dangerous, even with these navigational aids. And of course, they, they had the compass. They could uh, tell the direction uh, in terms of north, south, east, west. They had charts, Portolian charts. Portolian uh, is Italian for pilot. 
And so as they went into new areas, they very, very carefully mapped them out. And those charts became worth their weight in gold. So we're going to look at the mariners from each of the countries in turn. And the Portuguese were really the groundbreakers. And so we're going to start with the Portuguese. <clears throat> Prince, Prince Henry the, the Explorer was a, a member of the royal family who was very, very much interested in sponsoring all kinds of studies relating to navigation, astronomy, shipbuilding, cartography, and so forth. And it was under his sponsorship, he had set up a, an academy at Sagres in, in Portugal. It was under his sponsorship that the ships of Portugal took the lead in exploring the world. Initially, they went to the Canary Islands and then to the Azores and then down to Cape Bojador. And when they passed Cape Bojador, that was a significant step because they had believed that sea dragons lived in the sea south of Cape Bojador. So it took a great deal of courage to, to go ahead and continue to extend their exploration down the coast of Africa. And those explorations over a period of approximately, uh, we're looking at uh, approximately 30 years or so, uh, enabled them to then set the stage for the first major long voyage of discovery, that of Bartolomeu Diaz. He is the first maritime explorer to sail around the end of the African continent. And he named it the Cape of Storms. And when he went back to Portugal and told the king, I called it the Cape of Storms, he said, look, that's way too pessimistic. I'm going to call it the Cape of Good Hope. And so that's what it's been called ever since, the Cape of Good Hope. Well, on the shoulders of Diaz, along came, of, oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that, the, turn, the going around the Cape of Good Hope put to rest the theory that the Indian Ocean was landlocked. That had been the theory for, for centuries. And that put that theory to rest. And now that opened the door for further exploration by Vasco da Gama, who as you can see went around the Cape of Good Hope and continued up the east coast of Africa now and sailed across the Arabian Sea into India. It was the most ex extensive ocean open sailing, 6,000 miles of open ocean over a six month period. Can you imagine how brave, it must, how brave these individuals were to leave sight of land and sail to parts unknown, to the edge of, of the world, without really knowing where they were and just having faith that they would eventually find land? Well, he landed in Calicut, which is current day Calcutta, and he met with the king of Calicut, and he gave to the king a treasures that were certainly very, very impressive. Four cloaks of scarlet cloth, six hats, four branches of coral, a box with seven brass vessels, a chest of sugar, two barrels of oil, and a cask of honey. Somehow I don't think the king of Calicut was impressed. He did not sign a treaty with the Gama and with Portugal for long-term commercial uh, relationships, but he did sell him or give to him enough spices so that when da Gama returned to Portugal, the value of those spices was 60 times more than the cost of the expedition. So certainly that opened a lot of eyes and it, and it made it even more interesting and more imperative that further exploration take place in order to open up the trade to the Far East. We're still with the Portuguese here and although these voyages were sponsored by Portugal. Amerigo Vespucci was an Italian. Alonso de Ojeda was a Spaniard. They sailed under the Portuguese flag. They sailed together, by the way, and their first voyage in 1499 took them uh, through the, the Caribbean along the northeastern coast of what we call today South America. And a later voyage, just a couple of years later, went down the entire east coast of South America. So that showed that it really wasn't going to be possible to sail directly to Asia because there was this large landmass between Europe and Asia 
to the West. Now, perhaps you've never heard of Amerigo Vespucci, but his name was very, very important, and we use it, a form of it, virtually every day. In 1507, Martin Waldsee Muller, I think he was Dutch, drew that magnificent map there. As you can see, Africa is very, very well described because by that time, the Portuguese had, had really uh, done a lot of exploring in that part of the world. In the far left of that map is what we call today South America. And this is a blow-up of it. And you'll note that on Waldsee Mueller's map, he named that land America, which is the f uh, feminine Latin form of Amerigo. And so it was because of Amerigo Vespucci's writings, he described his voyages, they influenced Waldsee Mueller, and so now we call this hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, North, Central, and South America. Now think for a minute how Columbus must have felt about that. He had actually been the first European, as we'll see in just a moment, we haven't talked about it quite yet, to find the New World. But it wasn't named North Columbia or North Columbus or South Columbus, it was called America. Continuing with the Portuguese, Alfonso Albuquerque was a magnificent naval commander and he sort of consolidated the Portuguese influence and hold on various locations in Asia. And the Straits of Malacca, right there, that narrow passage, from time immemorial, was a very, very strategically important uh, waterway. Most, all of the seagoing traffic at that point in time from China and from the islands of current day Indonesia had to pass through the Straits of Malacca. And so they were able to, the Portuguese were able to establish a fort there and control that waterway, which is a, was a very important strategic uh, victory for them. A little bit further to the east were the mysterious Spice Islands. I already talked about how pepper came from uh, India, but Nutmeg was only grown on seven small islands, nowhere else in the world. The largest island, six miles long, and cloves were only grown on two very, very small islands. If you can imagine that. So these very, very valuable spices were just on these little islands. Let me show you a map of where they are. The um, Banda Islands, right there that we're talking about for nutmeg. They're so small, they, de they aren't even shown on this map, but they would be right about there. This is New Guinea here. And the islands of Ternate and Tidore are right there. So those, that total of nine islands had the total monopoly of all of the cloves and nutmeg in the world. And so it was that Albuquerque sent a fleet to find out where they were and establish a settlement on those islands so that they could then monopolize the entire trade in those very, very valuable spices. And that wasn't enough. He sent a fleet up into China just the next year. And the Portuguese set up a trading center on the island of Linton. I don't know if you can see it on the map. That's Macau. That's Hong Kong. So in this very central waterway right here, they were establishing diplomatic and commercial ties with China. So the Portuguese were way out in front of everybody in their discoveries. And this is a listing of the dates associated with those expeditions that I've just been talking about. So in the period of 1420 to 1513, less than a century, they went from a country that did not sail out of sight of land to a country that had already reached China and established significant trading relationships with China, with the Spice Islands, with India, and so forth. So they became a very, very powerful country because of the sponsorship of these maritime expeditions. Now let's talk about the Spanish. They weren't too far behind. And when you're talking about Spanish mariners, you've got to start with Christopher Columbus. 
he was from Genoa. He was not Spanish. He was from uh, what we call today Italy. Uh, a man of greater than normal stature, apparently a very religious individual, and also, uh, according to individuals who knew him, given to fits of very um, strong rage as well. So he was a very emotional guy. And he made a presentation to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, sort of like, um, you know, trying to get a startup going today, seeking the funding for a major commercial enterprise. He talked to them and they said, no, I don't think that uh, that's something we want to do. He was proposing to them, instead of going south and around the Cape of Good Hope, the way the Portuguese had, that they sail directly west. What a, an out-of-the-box solution that was. They were a little lukewarm about it, so he packed up his bags and headed for, for France because he was looking for another sponsor. Apparently, uh, the king and queen reconsidered, called him back before he left the country, and made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. They named him Admiral of the Seas. They, they promised to give him a significant percentage of the wealth that, that might come from the expedition. Um, and then they said, and you've got to come up with 25% of it yourself. So they, they funded 75%. He took care of 25% by borrowing it from various Italian uh, financial institutions. And he set off on his journey. Now, the first question, did Columbus believe the world was truly fat, flat? How many of you were taught that in elementary school? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, it looks like about 25% of you uh, also were taught that. And isn't everything we learned in elementary school true? <laughs> not at all, not at all true. Since the, the fourth century BC, since the time of Aristotle, uh, the academicians of Europe had known the world was a sphere. So that, I don't know where that got started. Of course, we were taught in elementary school, it's flat and you sail to the edge and you'll sail off the edge and you're gonna be uh, never heard from again. Well, that wasn't true, but, and everyone knew that, but Columbus did believe some things that were not believed by most of the scholars and academics of that day. And he was wrong on all three counts. First of all, by the way, this is the world that he envisioned. Um, there's Spain. This is China, Cathay on this map. He overestimated the size of the Eurasian landmass, and therefore, doing so, that brought the edge of the landmass closer to Europe. He believed that Japan was far to the east of China, and so it wasn't really that far away at all. And on top of that, he compounded his errors by saying that the Earth's diameter was uh, 5,000 miles less than it actually was. Now, the aggregate effect of all of that is that the Far East, where all of these trade goods are, isn't that far to the West. So let's just get on our ships and sail there. And of course, he wasn't uh, aware of a land mass in between uh, Europe and the Far East. So, bolstered by his strong opinions and his ignorance, he set out for the New World on second-hand, third-hand, modest-sized merchant vessels. They had not been uh, built for this purpose. They had been doing a lot of, of trading, mostly coastal trading. And he and 90 men set sail for the New World with the Nina the Pinta and the Santa Maria. They discovered the New World when they saw San Salvador Island. At two o'clock in the morning, one of the lookouts on the Pinta uh, on October 12, 1492, said, there she is, there's land. And uh, apparently the king and queen had promised a lifelong pension to whoever spotted land first. And so it was that Columbus said, I saw it first. So he wasn't a very nice guy in some respects. He ended up with the pension. He called, oh by the way, that's San Salvador Island is that first landfall that he saw. And just for your information, uh, a little bit of trivia, a little bit to the west of San Salvador, not more than 50 miles or so, I don't believe, is the island of Little San Salvador, 
which we visited on the first day of our cruise. The key was little San Salvador. So you can sail that you sailed where Columbus sailed. And by the way, as you'll see on a map in just a minute, before I get there, he called those islands the Indies because he thought he'd reached Asia. They later became known as the West Indies to differentiate them from the East Indies, which are islands that are actually in Asia. So he sailed past San Salvador, and I think it looks like he might have sailed right by our vacation island. And then over along the northern coast of, of uh, Cuba, it looks like he did a lot of back and forth there. And then over along the northern coast of Hispaniola, and those of you who might have been to Samana on another cruise line, uh, he went to Samana Bay and then back to Spain. <clears throat> and that was the first of a total of four voyages which are denoted on the map here. Please note that after the first voyage, the subsequent voyages, all of them entered the Caribbean in the southeastern portion because that's where the trade winds blow through. And he discovered, and, and all of the other mariners who came into the Caribbean from that point on, entered the Caribbean from that point. As you can see, uh, he uh, had the first extended cruise of the Caribbean uh, as he went around and around here on his second voyage. His third voyage was just sort of a, a quick pass through. And we've already talked about the fourth voyage when I was talking about Panama Canal and Costa Rica. His fourth voyage took him along the coast of the land that he named Costa Rica and then along the northern coast of Panama and he saw the Chagres River and then he sailed back to Spain. So we are at our second question now. Why do Brazilians speak Portuguese instead of Spanish? The Pope at that point in time saw that the Catholic monarchs of Portugal and Spain had made a lot of discoveries and so it was, he took it as his initiative to divide the world up between those two Catholic monarchs and he established a papal line of demarcation in 1493, this red line right here. And everything to the west he gave to the Spanish monarchs. Everything to the east belonged to the Portuguese. The Portuguese said, hold it, hold it, hold it, time out. We are the ones who, Amerigo Vespucci and uh, De Ojeda, I talked about them a moment ago, we are the ones who explored that area there. Let's move that line a little further to the west. And so it was that the Treaty of Tordesillas was signed by the Pope and by the monarchs of those two countries, establishing that line of demarcation which was halfway between the Cape Verde Islands and San Salvador Island. And look where it runs. The eastern portion of Brazil where most of the uh, inhabitants lived was given to the Portuguese. And that is why Brazilians speak Portuguese. This is the only explorer I'll talk about who did his exploring on Tierra Firme, on, on firm ground. He uh, was in Panama on the north coast there, heard about an ocean far off, in, in the, off to the uh, southwest, and he embarked on a journey in 1513 and this is the uh, route that he took. Ida means going, Vuelta means returning. And so he saw the Pacific Ocean. It wasn't named the Pacific Ocean at that point in time. He saw the ocean and he declared all of the lands bordering that ocean were given to the king and queen of Spain. In other words, everything on the borders of that ocean now were part of the Spanish Empire. So we are at our third question now. Who was the first man to sail around the world? Most of us would say Ferdinand Magellan. Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese mariner, he was sailing under the Spanish flag. He and five ships and a crew of about 270 individuals set sail to explore and circumnavigate the world. They had a lot of, of charts available to them. Uh, Amerigo Vespucci and De Ojeda had, had explored the, 
the uh, eastern coast of South America. And so he decided he was going to sail around and all the way around the world. He was not a very popular captain. And before they even reached the bottom of South America, what we call South America today, um, his troops had, his crews had mutinied a couple of times. One of the ships turned around and headed back to Portugal. And so it was a very inauspicious start for his crews. They left Portugal and sailed down along the eastern coast, sailed around through a, a narrow passageway of water that we now call the Straits of Magellan because he was the first one to map that out. And he sailed out into the new ocean. And it was a really rough passage. Any of you have gone around uh, to that part of the world, apparently the seas are very rough. And when he entered that new ocean, it was so smooth that he called it the Pacific Ocean. And that is why it is called that name. They sailed across the Pacific, a long voyage, almost a hundred days. They didn't know how long it would take, how far it was, whether their supplies would last them long enough to uh, make it to dry land again. <clears throat> and as you can see, they got to the Philippines, what we call the Philippines today. And it was at that location that Magellan's cruise ended. Apparently, he tried to convert one of the local chiefs to Christianity, and when the chief said no, he wasn't going to do it, that enraged Magellan, a fight broke out, and Magellan was killed at that point in time. And so, an individual by the name of Elcano took over the control of the expedition at that point in time and continued it until they were able to return to Portugal. Now, I need to answer the question. Who was the first person to circumnavigate the world? Well, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that five years before he embarked upon this circumnavigation of the world, he had traveled from Portugal to the Spice Islands, and he had acquired a slave by the name of Enrique. Enrique returned with him back to Portugal and sailed with him when he began his expedition around the world. Enrique continued with the fleet, the expedition, and when he reached his homeland, he became the first person to circumnavigate the world. Thank you. So, this really confused things. Now that we, they had an understanding of the world and, and the Portuguese and the Spaniards had done a lot of exploring, um, there needed to be another line. One line wouldn't divide the world. You needed another line on the other side of the world, didn't you? And so the Treaty of Zaragoza was signed in 1529. And Portugal's portion was somewhat larger than Spain's portion. The Spaniards wanted the Spice Islands that were right there, so they wanted this line to go a little bit more like that. And for the price of 350,000 golden ducats, the king of Portugal was able to uh, pay off the king of Spain, and that became the line of demarcation. So everything to the west of the Treaty of Tordesillas line and to the east of the Treaty of Zaragoza line belonged to the Spaniards, and everything to the east of the Tordesilla line and to the west of the Zaragoza line belonged to the Portuguese. But as you can see, the Spaniards sort of broke that a little bit. They, they really liked the Philippines. They felt like that would be a launching pad for their, their trade with China. And so this treaty didn't last all that long before it sort of broke down and the Spaniards poached the uh, Philippines. So this is a summary of everything that I've talked about so far. All of the, the, the Portuguese mariners are in the blue and, and sort of gray, 
and the, the white rows are the Spaniards. And you can see then the sequence, a lot of things were happening um, very, very close in time to each other. So over the period of, from 1488 to 1529, gosh, uh, somewhat around 40 years or so, so many things happened in the world. It was just a remarkable time for the expansion of uh, the European understanding of the world. Now, who discovered the Pacific? How many of you believe that it was Balboa? Nobody? Okay, <laughs> I think more than, more than a few of you did. Um, and in fact, September 1513 was, is uh, the date that I was taught. Well, when Balboa saw the Pacific Ocean, he was the first European to see it. But look, in 1512, the Portuguese arrived in the Spice Islands, which is part of the Pacific Ocean. Furthermore, they sailed through the Pacific Ocean to reach China. So clearly, the Portuguese, rather than the Spanish in the form of Balboa, were the first to see the Pacific Ocean. Okay, we need to talk about a few other countries. English, England, France, and the Netherlands. Let's talk about the English first. Um, the voyage of Giovanni Caboto. Obviously an Italian sailing under the English flag. I think most of us know that name as John Cabot. John Cabot sailed in those two years, and as you can see, he decided he would take a different route to try and find that elusive shortcut to the trade riches of the Far East. And he went into the Northwest and in 1497 sailed over by Newfoundland and then a little bit later in 1498 tried it even a little bit higher up and went down. Uh, so he was the first European to encounter the mainland North America since uh, Leif, uh, Leif Erikson in the 11th century. And he proved the existence of a shorter route through the North Atlantic was just not going to happen. Uh, I'm sorry, proved the existence of a shorter route across the North Atlantic, but also he proved that it wasn't a shortcut to Europe. But sailing that way, he sort of set the, the foundation for the further establishment of a settlement in North America by the English. The French, Verrazano, sailed directly across to what we call North Carolina today. He again also was looking for that shortcut, that total sea route to the Far East. And uh, that of course was not a successful venture, but he then was able to sail up along the coast near Newfoundland and set the stage for a French colony later. And that possibility was further enhanced by the voyages of Cartier, Jacques Cartier, uh, made several trips into that area. And I know many of you are from Canada and are probably familiar with this history, perhaps no, more so than, than those of us from the United States. But he sailed all the way down the St. Lawrence River uh, to Quebec City and even beyond that to, to current day Montreal. And so of course that then set the, up, up the opportunities for a French colony in that part of North America. Sir Francis Drake became the second European to circum, uh, the second expedition to try to circumnavigate the world. He was actually a privateer. Uh, England was at war with Spain at that point in time, so he went in search of riches. And he decided that he would sail from England down the east coast of South America and then sail up the western coast of the Americas looking for Spanish treasure ships that he would be able to rob. The name of his ship was the Golden Hind and he hit pay dirt off the coast of current day Peru. He captured a ship that had so much gold and silver that he threw all of his ballast overboard, the rocks and so forth that were used to stabilize the ship and put the gold and silver down there. And that then became the ballast for his ship. Now he sailed further north, and in fact, uh, touch, he was in Huatulco a, a little bit before we were there, and, and then on up to the, um, looks like uh, Oregon, Oregon Dunes. 
he had a cartographer with him and the maps that he drew of the western coast of North America were in use for centuries thereafter. Now he realized that he had sort of opened up a, 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 a bee's nest of, of uh, activity by capturing that Spanish treasure ship. He realized he could not retrace his steps back to England. And so without having intended to do so, he decided to sail across the ocean. And that is exactly what he did. He came down through the Spice Islands area and back around, back to England. And the Queen's half share of his cargo was more than the entire crown income for that year. So it was a remarkably successful trip in terms of adding to the, the treasury of England as well as adding to the knowledge of the western coasts of South, Central, and North America. Henry Behrens, a Dutch voyager, he focused on the northeastern passage. Everything, all of the, uh, everything I've been talking about up to this point in time, we're going south around Africa, south around South America, trying to, to take the shortcut directly across. No one had tried the northeastern passage. And over a period of three different voyages, he kept trying and trying because, after all, with the sun shining 24 hours a day, there can't be ice up there all summer long. Um, to his dismay, he found out that the ice pack was still very thick all year long. And so he was totally unsuccessful in his effort to find a northeastern passage. Henry Hudson sailed under two flags, actually. First of all, his first, second, and fourth voyages were with the English, and you can see them denoted by the red, the green, and the uh, sort of purplish uh, lines on the chart. He first of all tried that northeastern passage. He tried it again, he tried it first, and then he tried it again, and then he tried something a little bit further south, and of course he was sailing under the Dutch flag at that point in time, and that is why the Dutch ended up with Manhattan. Henry Hudson discovered it, and the river there, of course, is named after him. And then on his final voyage, back again under the English flag, he sailed up into what we now call Hudson Bay. Uh, very tragic end to uh, his voyage. He and his son and seven other crew members uh, were set adrift on an open boat by a crew that had mutinied, and they were left to drift and were never seen again. And so the age of discovery, as you might imagine, led to colonialism, the founding of colonies. So the British Empire was founded, or at least some of the colonies of the British Empire. New France, uh, the Spanish Empire, the Portuguese Empire, the various colonies, the Dutch over here in the Dutch East Indies. And so at the end of the age of discovery, so much more was known about the world than at the very beginning. And it, enabled, it really created uh, the beginning of the world as we know it today. And the day after tomorrow, we have another sea day, and I'll be happy to share with you a story about the third ancient civilization that I'll be talking about on this cruise, the Incas. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming.